everyone welcome back to the optimization toolbox i'm your host jenna redfield today we have my friend mackenzie green with us today and i want to read her instagram bio because <laughs> it's a lot and it go for it i like everything so it says vp social at who what where which is amazing co-host at the taylor strecker show columbia biz grad daughter of a civil rights icon daughter of a model former miss usa and i'm assuming that's which one is that the that is USA? Yeah, or? that well, that I'm a former Miss DC USA. Miss DC USA, and you're and you live in LA, so that's yep. a lot of things <laughs> to start with. So, and that's only like a portion of it, which is crazy. Yeah, and it's like, and so uh, let me just give a little backstory for me. So uh, we connected, I believe, on Twitter first. Yeah. Yep. And it was when we were doing that writing program. Yeah, we were doing the same writing for thirty for thirty. Yeah. And then and then it transitioned to TikTok. And then yep. we became friends on TikTok. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I encouraged you to join TikTok, right? You you said to me, because you were doing, when we were doing the writing cohort, because I had an account because I yes. work in social. Yes. And you were doing a whole thing where you were like, okay, yes, I'm writing the essays, but for 30 days, I'm going to make oh, a TikTok. TikTok. Yeah. And I think I wrote to you like, that's the most genius thing I've ever heard. I need mm -hmm. to start posting on TikTok. And so, yeah, then I actually started posting instead of just like creepily watching yeah. the entire world on there. And I felt like I felt cool because I'm like, oh, I, I influenced someone to like, uh, yeah. take a step forward <laughs> in a different platform. That's awesome. So that's Absolutely. like, I remembered that. And then obviously I followed you and then found out you were in LA. And then I was like, I'm going to LA. So then we yeah. met up in person so that we just met in person for the first time, which is so crazy. Cause I, I think like back when I lived there, I didn't know anyone on the internet. Like I didn't have any internet yeah. friends 10 years ago. And now I have a ton of internet friends that I've met just from everywhere you know so it was really yeah I met, an, I met another friend also from tiktok that i also got to see out there too so it was like it was just crazy that like you can have now friends all over the country all over the world so if you go somewhere you can actually like find someone to like actually have coffee with so it's just like it's such a cool thing yeah. the internet we well, you know so. it's funny you say that it just made me think of it only because you said <laughs> had the pageant in the intro is i remember that was like the running joke when you oh. would win is that you're like i have a friend in every state in in america it, like it was always so funny to me that we would be like so if i go to any state i can call somebody it's like okay guys you wow. can't just randomly call somebody would be like i'm in south dakota can i come to your house oh my God. um so yeah <laughs> that's so crazy um i well, is it like miss congeniality like i that's like my one thought for so here's is. the thing for me it was like a lot of okay. times when people ask that because so i had been that's why i joked like my my profile only gives a taste mm -hmm. of it so i had been uh, a very accomplished swimmer uh mm -hmm. for over a decade of my life so i and then i had also been a, a pro-am horseback rider so i would wow. try yeah so in the sun in the winters i would do winter circuit riding mm -hmm. but i on swimming i was a junior olympian like national mm -hmm. record holder Dang. like all this Girl, kind of crazy you're stuff so accomplished. it's crazy it's <laughs> i'm a i'm a member of overachievers anonymous i i used to be a recovering member but i'm like i don't think i've ever fully left but um, so I had been very, very accomplished in swimming, had gone to college to swim division one swimming. And thank God my father had the foresight where he said, I don't want you to go any place on scholarship. He had gone to college on scholarship. Mm -hmm. My mom had also, uh, my dad, obviously for his own reasons and my mom, because she's brilliant. Um, and so he was very much like, I want you to have the option that if you, if this is not the path, you can walk away. And I got it's mighty. It was a perfect storm between injury um, issues between myself and the coach that I ended up having to walk away from swimming. So I had been like a tomboy, but I had always watched the pageant with my mother every single year of my life. Um, and so truly had like a nervous breakdown on my 20th birth, the night before my 20th birthday. And so like had, you know, I call it my bucket list, but it was like my quarter life crisis list. And so first on there was running a marathon. As soon as I finished the marathon, my best friend was like, so what's next? And I was like, I want to go to Miss Universe. And so I am much like yourself, probably I will break down any goal into like the deliverable mm. steps that I mm -hmm. need to get there. So I figured out how do I reverse engineer my way at least into Miss USA. Um, and so for me, it was Miss Congeniality. Like I mm. was the grody tomboy that had either smelled like chlorine or horse manure. Like I, I think there was like a point in my sorority where people were just like, deodorant is not optional. Please embrace it as a thing. And I was like, what? 
And so I basically like reverse engineered this whole thing, found this pageant coach in Puerto Rico, um, who was very much like Michael Caine. She was like the winningest, mm. she's like the Guinness world record holder for most Miss Universe wins coached. And she's the first woman to ever coach a country to back to back wins at the time. Um, and I basically moved between my sophomore and junior year of college uh, down to Puerto Rico with her to train full time. And so like, I always say it's a little bit of like miscongeniality mixed with Princess Diaries where mm. like I came back and I remember I had like, I think I had on like a big old oversized sweatshirt and people were like, why are you wearing a sweatshirt in Miami? What's wrong? Are you like, oh. like what's going on? And I like took off this sweatshirt and my like baseball cap and people were like, oh my God, what's going on here? And I was like, <laughs> just ignore it. Please ignore it. Mm. All of what you're seeing. So yeah, for me, it was miscongeniality and my, it, and I have like a whole story of how I ended up not being miscongeniality by choice. Mm. And so the person who did become miscongeniality frequently jokes like, you know, what's real miscongeniality is passing on it mm. for somebody else to get it because you want them to feel good about them. So, so oftentimes I always say I would have had my full mm. Sandra Bullock moment if I had just been a little selfish and taken uh, the miscongeniality for myself. But um, now looking back, I'm, I'm grateful that yeah. the person who got it, got it. Cause she, I, I really felt in my heart of heart. She deserved something wonderful for what she went through to get there. Gotcha. So how did you transition from that to, so how old were you when you did that? Probably like in your 20s. I was 20. Yeah, I okay. was 20. So like in college. So yep. how did you go from that to then, I guess, maybe your career path moving forward? Yeah, business school. Well, I had yeah. always known, right, that I want, so I, I grew up, again, I'm going to say in things that sound <laughs> insane for a human to say, but when I was really young, when I was about four years old, Disney made a movie about my father. Okay. And I got to meet um, Michael Eisner and I became like, we knew him and I was, yeah. became, ups but I, where everybody else was like princesses, Disney. Mm. I was like, who is this man that is best mm. friends with Mickey Mouse? Mm. So I've always kind of been <laughs> obsessed with business and what is the path to get mm. to his position. And I had a thought, you know, my dad went on to become a managing director on wall street. So I always was really fascinated by this world of kind of, business and corporate. So what weirdly happened when the pageant ended is I was in school for broadcast journalism, but it was 2010. Like mm -hmm. markets were not looking to hire, uh, you know, women who were going to cost them a lot of money in hair and makeup and post-production. And so I was sending my reel everywhere, but at the same time, um, Lehman had collapsed. My dad and somebody else were going into business and it was kind of like, Hey, you're free and you seem to under, you know, you'd be a great junior associate. You, you had a <laughs> double major and a business minor. Cause I'm a crazy person. <laughs> um, and he was like, do you want to give us some help? And so I really kind of translated my like world of storytelling and taking complicated sports plays and translating kind of our world of financial language into plain English. And so I was, I was the, this is my daughter, the former beauty queen who is working here now as an associate. And then truly somebody just kind of said in passing, like, oh, I wish we could make sense of this thing called Twitter for our business. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hmm, interesting. And so, yeah, basically like kind of raised my hand and started my own social media marketing consulting group, uh, fairly fresh out of college. I, I even, and the reason the pageantry part of it overlaps is I remember a client googling me mm. or googling the name and they emailed me and they were like really excited to work with you also you know what's crazy there's a woman named Mackenzie also from DC who was in Miss USA mm. and I was like yeah that's also me um but yeah I definitely I missed kind of what I was doing and I also realized I was interested in entertainment but also luxury retail and the whole industry was moving so fast that I pretty much parlayed everything I learned in pageantry and anything I had won in pageantry to help me go back to Georgetown. Uh, so I went to, not back to, went to Georgetown to finish a program in corporate finance uh, and then used all of that to put together my application for business school and ended up going to Columbia Business School. Um, and weirdly, 
in all things pageantry. Um, Jamie Kern Lima, the founder of It Cosmetics, mm -hmm. is a former Miss USA candidate who went to Columbia Business School. And the woman who is like the lead correspondent on uh, CNBC, kind of like the CNBC equivalent in China, she is a former Miss New York. And the crazy part was the year before I competed on the stage, I went to Miss USA to see it in person. And that young woman who is the financial correspondent was on stage as Miss New York. And Jamie Kern Lima was selling her It Cosmetics mm -hmm. at a booth in the thing. So that whole uh, the Miss USA 2009 was a nexus event uh, mm -hmm. for all of us. Uh, and I guess somehow Columbia Business School must have a beauty queen to business school pipeline going because there's now been three of us that have gone wow. there and we've done fairly well for ourselves. That's amazing. And I feel like it's all about timing and connection. Yes. And and then so how did you um like parlay that into what you're doing now? Like I mean I know we can kind of yeah. put a lot of things in between then. So how did you yeah. get to your job now? Yeah. So I um came out of business school and I while I was in business school, because like we established, I'm a crazy person. I basically, my final year of B school, um, I had come back from interning in LA at Paramount and pretty much found a full-time job at NBCU. So I rotated through a few departments there. Um, I was on lifestyle. So I was there for the ad sales side, working on everything from Bravo, E, Esquire. Um, and then went to DMV, DV, DMVPD platform. So that was early streaming. And I remember classmates like making fun of me because I was talking about Fubo TV or doing deals mm. uh, with uh, YouTube television for NBCU. And then uh, finished out at Telemundo. Loved my time at Telemundo. Got to work on the World Cup, which once in a lifetime wow. experience. Um, and yeah, then that led to an opportunity with Betches. Um, and starting uh, the branded content department there under their sales team, sales leadership, and then literally had a, a campaign that I was super proud of, um, this idea of like connections, shared with somebody uh, that, you know, somebody in my network that I was super proud of this thing I had done with Amazon Studios, and they were like, hey, BET is looking to launch a streaming network. Are you, you open to it? And I was like, ooh, okay, maybe. And uh, yeah, found myself as a founding team member at BET Plus. And then while I was there, I got to work on some incredible projects. And, and then this opportunity here at Who What Where came. And within my first nine months at Who What Where, we were acquired after like oh, 15 wow. years of being independent. So overnight, um, my job went from just kind of like social strat overseeing this incredible team of women um, to, yeah, all of a sudden now it includes Who, What, Where, Marie Claire US, Marie Claire UK, uh, working with different social teams across fashion, beauty, homes, and women's lifestyle. Uh, yeah, to figure out like, wow. what is our social strategy and digital innovation that we're going to try? But it's it's been a whirlwind. Yeah, it, it was a weird path where I, you know, I kind of always kept my options open. I'm somebody that like, I know where I would like to be on the last day of my career. So I really just make decisions in service of that vision at the end. Okay. I feel like I have 800 policies. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's start, let's, let's keep going that path. How do you know what you want in your career? Like, how did you make that decision? Cause that's something that I've never really had is, is yeah. like the, is like the concrete like result of what I want and what I'm aiming for because I honestly don't know every day I'm like ah, yeah like maybe I'll go this way maybe I'll go this way I don't have a path what do, how yeah. do you know what you want so I uh, had the pleasure of doing an NBA fellowship at UCLA and we had a great professor there who is the one that got me into this way of seeing my career as he said don't think about your career path imagine where you are the day you retire mm. like on the day you have decided you are retiring. And I thought he had a good point. He was like, some of you might be old. Some of you might be young. Some of you might be, you know, and I remember having this very vivid image of what I thought my retirement day looked like and everything that was happening. So truly it's that I just, I try to be open to opportunities. I mean, I really, I really lean into that idea of like, luck is preparation and opportunity. So I just try to be ready for those lucky breaks of like doing the work I need to do or seeing opportunities in white space that I don't fill in that are in service of that last day of my career. 
And so, yeah, I, I, I have like my target companies. I have, you know, my mentor Orlando Baez says it best, like my triangle where it's like comp Mm -hmm. visibility and autonomy is like, I'm always thinking at all times of that triangle and what hits those points. Um, Yeah. And then outside of that, I, I'm kind of like, you know, I think I confuse people because I never, I'm not going to be a Bob Iger who's like with the Disney corporation from like the day Mm. my career starts to the day I die. But I hope that my career is incredibly impactful for the work that I do. Yeah. And I mean, it already is. I mean, I'm seeing all of the work that you've done already and like you've really risen to an amazing level. And I feel like you have a lot of responsibility for your uh, role right now it's it, you were telling me about all these meetings that you had and stuff and how you're overseeing so much so what is okay so what does a day in your life look like I know we've, we've talked a little bit about this but yeah. like what does what does that role even mean and how how and then you also have this podcast and the and video <laughs> show like how do you how do you manage your day I think I asked you this when I was in LA I was like how do you yeah all this? truly when we were like drinking matches and you were like where is your time and I'm like huh, I don't know like I think I looked down at my phone and I was like yeah. and it's time for me to go yeah. my social yeah. time is over yeah. um usually so I am trying to be kinder to myself um I am trying to be kinder about my routine so a routine I had in the past which was like 5 a.m workouts or 5 a.m wake-ups mm-hmm. not serving me as much mm-hmm. so I try to ease into my morning go to sleep early enough so that I can wake up without my alarm um do some journaling uh typically because I now have uh kind of colleagues in the UK I try my best to keep people from scheduling anything like before 6 a.m. only so that I don't have to feel like I'm rolling out of bed and Mm. have been shot out of a rocket. But typically there's like UK meetings that can be anything from like social questions, peers on other titles or kind of social managers who work on other titles across future or um, kind of other members of senior leadership that I have to talk to. And so block out those meetings. Then there's a little breakfast, some stretching. Then we get into the New York portion of the day. Um, Maybe sometimes in between there are lovely podcasts or recording with my radio host. Um, And then there's kind of like my LA side of my work day. I am a massive fan of uh, Jake Knapp and John Zerkaski. He goes by Jay-Z. Their book, Make Time. Um, I really can only make sense of my day by setting Mm. a highlight for the day. Mm. If I try to operate off of a to-do list, and I think you probably Mm -hmm. know this and a lot of your like guests you've had Mm -hmm. on, when your day is super packed and you do a lot of meetings, if you try to be like, I got to get eight things done today. Mm -hmm. If I'm just like, by the end of today, and sometimes it's not even work related. I'm like, by the end of the day, all the boxes I got of like gifted stuff for my creator work needs to be taken to the garbage room and I've won the day like Mm. so I always try to pick some task that'll take me anywhere between 60 to 90 minutes is like the daily highlight and that's how I decide like what the main thing is like it's you know it's the Ryan Holiday keep the main thing the main thing and how do you okay so this I mean we can go down this tangent if we want to because I mean (laughs) this is fascinating to me because I I struggle with time management. That's something I, and that's why like so much of my content is on that because I'm like, I want to get better at it. Like I'm, I'm trying to get better at time management. Obviously with my ADHD, I'm like, ah, and that's why I do notion and all this stuff. What is your, what systems do you use to track your time to manage your to-do list to do all this stuff? Cause you have to fit all these in. It's like a puzzle, right? Your time is like a puzzle and you have to fit all these different things in. How do you like, do you plan ahead or how do you like how do you yeah. plan out all of this and like also for so, your own content you know like I'm like yeah because I know you make TikToks and I'm like when do you do those <laughs> well I think the funny thing too is like whenever I tell people I have ADHD they're like no oh. that's impossible and I'm like the fact that I do 18 jobs should be yeah, a dead giveaway say, that yeah, I have that, ADHD I just say, guys. I, I, it's not surprising to me I'm like you sound like me so I'm like okay. thank you yeah. because people oftentimes will be like you're very gregarious and you work a lot and I'm like do you guys think that everybody with ADHD is just mm. standing in their living room going I don't know where to go like no we we yeah. know and our brain will do it all mm. like I think so I do struggle with time management a lot which is why I think I landed on the make time um Mm -hmm. framework so I use a bullet journal I have tried a lot of other things I love I love notion Mm -hmm. it just but I'm sure you know this it's like you can get ADHD paralysis because you can make it whatever you want 
And because I am not a skilled person, I'm like, you know what I like? I'm like, this bullet journal is whatever mm-hmm. I need and I can write in it and it doesn't scare me. You know what's <laughs> funny? I One of my very good friends is the head of uh, education at Bullet Journal. So I want, I've want i had her on the podcast before, but this is before she worked for them and she yeah. had a really popular Bullet Journal. Con- I want to get her back on because she's great. Her name is Jessica. She lives here in the Twin Cities oh. and I've been friends with the, her. We went to high school together. The greatest day of my life is when the Bullet Journal people reach out to me and they were like, we would love to repost oh. your system on our page and I was like I've made it like this is (laughs) this is it but I definitely it's bullet journaling it's alarms for everything to myself Mm, um I yeah I'm really big on the um para system why am I forgetting yes oh Tiago Forte Mm -hmm. yeah Tiago Forte's um build Mm -hmm. a second brain so yeah I love that book yeah, it's the way my digital notes are set up is very much aligned with the PARA mm-hmm. system. It's the only thing that kind of helps me yes. know what we're working on. Like right now, like I said, I'm writing one of our cover stories for Who, What, Where, and I have everything for the cover story from like random quotes that pop in my head to the actual draft itself all sitting in a folder dedicated to this person mm-hmm. in my projects section. Um, so those are like the big ones. My Google calendar is everything, mm-hmm. even down to like friends wanting to get dinner. I'm like, can you please send me a calendar invite? And like, same, like, same. like I'm just like, I and I try to tell people all the time, like if it is not a calendar invite, mm-hmm. I will forget. And not because it doesn't matter. It's because I truly have only so much mm-hmm. cognitive bandwidth that I'm so like, true to keep up with like I know I said it when we were off air but Mm -hmm. even like dating I'm like sir you saying to me (laughs) would you like to go to dinner tomorrow means nothing I need you Mm -hmm. to send me a cal invite confirm a location (laughs) like set the time because I will when the when I'm done with my last meeting we'll sit down on my couch and fully unplug my brain and watch bravo for hours it's like so and then you being like oh like i've even had men who (laughs) completely forgot we had a date and then send me the text it's like so sorry hun sorry i forgot and i'm like you forgot i didn't even know you were here (laughs) you and not because i'm trying to be shady or petty but i literally forgot you existed because that happens to me all the time i just watch a tiktok about this how like people with ADHD struggle with friendships because we just sometimes forget yeah. people exist. And it's like, yes. it's like, it's like, I don't miss people. Like the way I am so grateful for my community of friends and family who understand this. Mm-hmm. So like my best friend had a baby. Mm-hmm. She and I have been trying to schedule FaceTime for me to see the baby. God bless her that when she doesn't hear from me, or if I don't hear from her, for that she doesn't hit me with like a you missed it Mm. like she'll just be like she will kindly be like and here's a picture of nolan today and i'm like i love you thank you thank Mm. you for never hating me about this but yeah i think for me it's like everything comes down to it's really just cal newport time blocking Mm. but in a thing that constantly dings me on my watch or dings me on my phone to remind me like, Hey, you said you'd read or Hey, you said you talked to Jenna, like yeah. get on your things. I honestly, well, I was going to say one of my hacks is to use the Alexa and set that up with your Google calendar. So it'll tell yeah. me out loud, like, Hey, I like 10 minutes from now you have a podcast. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I, if it's not on my calendar, I am going to forget yeah. it for sure. And yeah. I think, and also like looking at the day ahead being like, okay, where do I have to be? I've started, I told you, I'm starting this new series where I'm walking and talking with people. And instead of me doing email tag with them, I'm like, sign up for a time. Yes. And like, these are what I have available. Having I was scheduler, you obsessed know? with that. When you sent that, I was like, this is so much easier to me than, because e-. I'm really, again, it all comes down to cognitive bandwidth. I do not have the time to keep mm-hmm. up with the 14 emails yes, to schedule stuff for our podcast. Like yes. I just had that conversation with my producer today. I said, we mm-hmm. got to find something because I'm not going to be able to maintain this, bro. And and the other thing, this is a hack. Again, I have a million hacks. That's like what I my podcast is about. Uh, <laughs> get a direct uh, URL to your Zoom link. And that's what you clicked on today. So it's generatefield.com forward slash Zoom. It redirects to this, my personal Zoom 
And so then instead of me having to remember all that super long zoom number, it's yeah. just an auto redirect, which I use with my funnel software. Again, I can get very nerdy about this. Cause I'm I love this so it. much, but like, but like I had, I saw someone do that one time and I was like, I need to just have a permanent link. So then yeah. when, when you've booked the, the podcast with me, it's already the zoom link and it's generatefoodcom forward slash zoom. So even if you forget it, it's like, it's my name. Yeah dot com forward slash zoom like it's it's very i love that so much it's just it's really i just i've had to i don't even think it's a case of like have i gotten better with time management i've gotten better systems i've realized i have to have systems and i also have to be flexible enough to be like this system isn't working right so like i started with trello because of cal newport Mm -hmm. And truly there are days where I forget the Trello's there. So then like, okay, we're going to have to make this a Google sheet that Mm -hmm. we fill out, that it's myself, my producer, my editor, the network, all filling it out. Same thing with like, we have a sauna for work. Mm -hmm. I have to separately (laughs) use my system to remind myself that things are in a sauna for me to go to, because I have been known to get the ping, the occasional ping from our, you know, one of our art directors being like, Hey, you're supposed to review this. And I'm like, and, and that's really, I'm very much with like, I agree with Cal Newport. I think you can earn, I think for those of us with ADHD, we have a level of idiosyncrasies to how we work. Mm -hmm. And I do think you earn yourself those idiosyncratic credits, not by being the person that can respond the fastest, but by Mm -hmm. being the person that's the most reliable to get Mm -hmm. the work done. And so that's really also what I push myself on is like, what are the systems that allow you to be the most reliable people will get their work on time ahead of time so that then Mm -hmm. when you need that time to stand in front of the fridge and be like where do I keep my vegetables like (laughs) that nobody is like where is Mackenzie where is Mackenzie where is she gone I had to explain this to my roommate the other day because like we we were having a little bit of an argument because I'm not the cleanest in the kitchen and I basically told her, I was like, I have to come up with a system for myself. Otherwise yeah. this won't work. Like I have to come up with some sort of alarm or something to like, yeah. cause I'll just like leave. Also, I don't know if you do this. Apparently today they should do thing, leaving the cabinets open. Absolutely. So oh, cabinets open. There's a dish right now on, yeah. on my guest bed that I can see that I'm like, oh, yeah. I never picked that up yesterday. But it's funny because I found out that leaving cabinets open is an ADHD thing. Like it literally That's is an so ADHD funny. symptom that my mom always complained about growing up. She's yeah. like, and it's just because in my head, it's just like, I don't like think about it. like, it's just like, I don't know what it is. I'm just like, I don't shut You know cabinets. what's funny is, is a huge, this isn't even like a debate. This is like a running disagreement my mom and I have, which is she loves decor and she mm-hmm. loves to design homes and spaces as to what makes sense to neurotypical people, yeah. but that looks aesthetically pleasing. My thing is nobody in this family is neurotypical. I don't know why we try to, it's like, then. so she will come visit me and it's like, why are all your hair care products in a basket next to the sofa? And I'm like, because I remember- <laughs> to do my hair while I'm watching TV mm-hmm. sitting on the sofa. So putting him in the bathroom is a useless endeavor mm-hmm. because I will never go from the yeah. living room into the bathroom to get all the things and oh, bring them true. out here. Yeah. And so it's like you, when you said the thing about the kitchen, it made me think like I put all my sauces recently in the drawers that are typically for your veggies. And I've mm-hmm. put all my veggies <laughs> and fruits on the door yes i get that because i was like i'll always search for a sauce like if i want ketchup i will search and i'm like but if i cannot see like again my poor mother out of sight goes out of nuts. mind out of sight out of the, mind you don't the way remember. this woman would hang entire like matching sets together and then be like why do you never wear this set and i was like because i didn't no, yeah. it was there. I thought the pants were missing. So like, she will come visit me and be like, this house makes no sense. And I'm like, mm. it makes all the sense in the world to get things done. And it's the same thing with my work systems. I yeah. feel like if anybody else saw me, mm. they'd be like, oh, why don't you plan the week out ahead? I have, I work in a corporate job. I, people throw stuff on my calendar. Mm, true. So at the end of the day, I then look at the next day mm. and map out the stuff it's like okay if the highlight is I have to have my report done it's gonna be done in this block so now let me put on my calendar so nobody schedules anything like do not disturb then it's like okay and and then I can go to sleep peacefully knowing 
I know what needs to get done tomorrow. There's time blocked out for it. I But it's like, if you were to say to a neurotypical person, they'd be like, this is my to-do list on Monday. Mm. And it's like, then the week yeah. takes off, meetings get scheduled. And if you have ADHD, it's like your brain just goes, mm, can't compute and you, yeah. and nothing gets done. <laughs> yeah. And I think it honestly, for neurotypicals too, though, I, I don't think they always accomplish everything that they say they do. No, I they don't, know, don't you know. but they have a better... I don't know how to say this, but like they have a better way of BSing their way mm. around it as we're like my ADHD, the way my ADHD is set up, I will 1 million percent get overwhelmed and then immediately go on Instagram stories and just be farting around. And then it'll like, and then it'll yep. hit me like, oh, my boss follows me. There are people from yeah. my company that follow me who are watching me be like, guys, do you ever sometimes stare at the sky and wonder <laughs> what happened? what happened to all like and they're looking being like yeah don't you owe me something right now like oh yeah that's always <laughs> scary I I think one of the things I realized is I like if I have an idea for a story I should wait 24 hours because yep. it's probably not a good idea and I just have to yeah. like it, like because I it's like my intrusive thoughts take over and I'm like oh exactly. I should post this right now and then I, I regret just, it I almost, I almost posted that yesterday on my Instagram because god bless my boss again ADHD I yeah. will sometimes in moments of stress like voice my intrusive thought mm. and so I we were having a very good meeting I basically went you know I thought I was getting fired and she's <sighs> like who told you this and I was like mm. no nobody me and my brain my brain and I had some time alone last Thursday and we decided we were getting like it was just this hilarious moment where I and oh I gosh. almost went on Instagram and said shout out it. to the man I would, I would yeah. love that. <laughs> and I was like oh shout out yeah. to the managers that embrace those of us with ADHD that let our intrusive thoughts come out in a meeting because like the look on her face was just like and I know from a neurotypical perspective, she's like, yeah. oh, she's having, she's having imposter syndrome. And I'm like, no, no, it's just me and my brain were left yeah. alone long enough that we were like, we're probably getting fired. Well, that's mm. fun. Let's just read a book since we're obviously getting fired. Like, that, that is my go-to stress relief too, is reading a book. It's just yeah. like, yeah. Like, oh, I, I like, actually, I think I, I'll tell you about this book that I read last week that I, I actually just did a podcast episode about it. It's called The Bug in Our Brain. I had Ooh. never heard of it. I highly recommend it. It's on Amazon Ooh. Kindle Unlimited. I don't know if you have that, but uh, yes. it's, it's, so it's free. And I'm actually going to have the author come on the podcast because I love the book so much. I reached out to him on you, LinkedIn. You and I are so alike in that. I will reach out to authors on LinkedIn yeah. and in their DMs every day being like, I have questions. And they're like, hi person who read my book why are you sending me four paragraphs and I'm like because I liked it and I have feelings and they're yeah. like okay well I think the author should be flattered by that I would if I, was I do author, too I would love that that's why I do it because Ryan Holiday had talked about that that he was like oh nothing makes you feel better as an author than when somebody shows up to like a book signing and they've like read the book and written in the margins and so I just try to be like a kind reader yeah, but it, the book was about self-worth and it was really interesting because I realized that I don't have a high self-worth, but I have high self-confidence. So it's there's two different things and I didn't realize it until I read this book and it like made oh, wow. me realize so much that was missing in my life was how much I felt I was worth as a person without being productive. And I think that, you know, as I don't know, are you a three on the Enneagram? I, I have never are. taken my any everybody's like you got to take this test and I'm I've pretty sure you're a three it. because three is like very like ambitious and like you yeah know, business focused in that way yeah. but, so I always thought I was a two which is more of like the helper so yep. I but then I have a friend he's very into the Enneagram and he he kept telling me for like six months he's like Jenny you're a three you're not a two <laughs> And so I finally believed him. He said, but you, you have a wing. So it's, I'm a three wing too. So I'm leaning towards a two as a three. Ooh. It's yeah. You have to look into it, but no, I this is like, right. As somebody who loves astrology, this is up my yeah. alley. Yeah. It's, 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 it's more, but like, and so I actually know all of my friends numbers too, because again, That's this so one fun. friend is so into it that he got all of yeah. my friends into it. So now I know all of my friends numbers and stuff. So it kind of helps me kind of categorize people in a way. But anyways, I could do a whole episode on like Enneagram. That'd be interesting. I actually, love that so I much. I, I think I had an Enneagram expert on a couple years ago, but, but, but anyways, so like, I think that, okay, now I lost my train of thought. 
but basically, so I, I had this, this guy is going to come on and he was talking about self-worth. And I just think that's so interesting to me. And one of the things that you and I really connected on is books. And I think we've kind of given each other book recommendations. Yeah. How did, like, what is, how is reading a part of your life? And I know you kind of also are into like biohacking. How has all of that kind yeah. of influenced, is it because of your ADHD that you started doing this or how do you kind of what was that, that so that? I, I i mean it's like my my brain was sabotaging me for not sabotaging it was like you got to find better systems so again grew up dyslexic had struggles mm. reading i always joke that i think that's why i got to be a good talker because if you have not read any of you know the current chapter of catcher in the rye you learn how to razzle dazzle your way through an english class like the sheer fact that i was an ap english student should tell you thank you should tell you all how great i was at certain aspects of school but not at others Mm -hmm. and so basically like business school was such a struggle for me because of the case reading it made me hate reading even more and so ran and then so it was like a couple things randomly I'm like shout out to uh what's her face Emma um Emma Roberts she started a book club when I started when I was living in New York so I would get these very like I don't know they felt very like manic pixie dream girl books Mm -hmm. that I'd be like reading on the subway being like everybody thinks I'm the main character so that kind of got me back into reading was like using the time of my subway commute to read and I think I read the most that year was like nine books and I was like Mm -hmm. I'm killing it oh my god I'm such a massive reader then I would say a few I would say almost like maybe five years ago, I discovered like Jim Quick. And for me, that was such a massive vision expander because this was a man who like grew up dyslexic, had a traumatic brain injury, all this stuff. And here he was being like, I read a book a week. I do X, Y, Z. Like I can memorize anything. So I kind of became like, I've, I think my brain works. And if the pageant is any indication, I, my brain works in a very like Carol Dweck way, which is like, if I can expand my mindset and have a growth mindset on something, it's over. Like Mm. I, I will figure it out. Like I will go from never having to run a mile to run a marathon. Mm. I will go from not knowing how to wear heels to being a beauty queen. So like, for me, it was like, Jim opened up this pathway that then I started like looking into his techniques and stuff. And I think what really got me was this idea that you can download decades worth of knowledge into days in a book. So it wasn't even my ADHD. It was the fact that I was badly dealing with imposter syndrome around moving so quickly. And I guess in a sense, meteorically through my career Mm -hmm. and needing to like figure it out fast Mm -hmm. and So I then started immediately being like business books, memoirs, Mm -hmm. self-help, like, you know, then that led to learning about stoicism and being Mm -hmm. open to ancient philosophy and all I love Ryan holiday. Like I'm a massive fan. Like I always say the greatest day of my life is when my dad was on Ryan holiday's podcast. And then the most, yes. And then the most embarrassing day of my life is when my dad was on Ryan holiday's podcast. He He talked about me. And I think what's so, don't even... this episode. <laughs> oh, and Ryan opens it with being like talking about me. And I think what's so embarrassing is my dad doesn't understand who Ryan Holiday is. So in his oh, yeah. mind, this is yeah. some friend of mine mm-hmm. who he's doing a solid for. And I'm like, like he literally takes a phone call at one point in the podcast recording. Oh yeah, my gosh. I don't, I've never, I'm mortified. More, I texted him and said, I don't want to talk to you for a week. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ryan's like messaging me being like, I love talking to your father. Your dad's so smart. And Wait, I'm like, so how did this connection happen? How did, did because, you know him? No, or? I took his Stoicism 101 course. Oh. And again, like you, I write notes. I say, mm-hmm. so I'm like writing notes. I'm raising my hand and speaking mm-hmm. up in class. And then at the end of it, I wrote him a whole letter, ultimately mm-hmm. saying like, I always thought Stoicism was like, for white guys in tech Mm. and that like being in his course really taught me to see like the intersectionality and potential in stoicism and blah 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 next thing you know I'm telling him about my dad and he's like I'd love to have him on and I'm like Mm. dad don't don't embarrass me Mm. but (laughs) back to the reading of it all I just I really I've really fallen in love with the reading as a way to get up to speed because I Mm. slowly am learning like there's a book for everything it's like um I'm looking at my 
uh, bookshelf, there's a book by Neil Hoyne mm-hmm. called Converted. And when we got acquired, we are now in a very analytical company that doesn't operate off of like feelings and intuition. Mm-hmm. And so immediately reading his book and getting up to speed and how do I speak more in the language of numbers mm-hmm. and stats in regards to these gut feelings I have about things. So like, I and then, that. um, It's amazing. And then coupling it with Dan Heath has a book called Make Numbers Work. This was recommended to me. Mm -hmm. That one was amazing because now I'm learning when I'm putting these stats together, how to make them more narrative, how to make Mm. people feel more included in the statistics, because this is also not a social first company. So I don't need senior leadership Mm. to feel like I'm talking above them. I'm telling them a story that they can go share. But like, ultimately for me books have become this great refuge and then on the side like in 2020 I was working full-time at BET which is a black streaming platform Mm -hmm. there are protests happening right outside my door in Harlem Mm -hmm. which I would go to and then I would come home and read romance novels so they've also been like an amazing escape and a place for me to like find this this solace in when I, you know it's like I would read yeah. uh, Jasmine Guillory so it's like mm-hmm. nothing felt like more of a balm to my soul than reading these books with you know black women as the as the main character in these romance novels as I'm like yeah. out on the street screaming for for my humanity I was just like wow books are books are wild so now I've fallen yeah. back in love with reading That's- and it's like yeah, it's like uh, over a hundred books a year that I'm I'm yeah, clearing. Wow. And okay, I did forty last year, and I thought that was a lot. So you like, you here's the funny part: is people oftentimes are like, "There's no way you're learning all of this." But again, oh. me and my expansive mindset, I randomly got into memory athletics in 2020. Yeah. So I'm oh, like, nice. yeah. So I'm like, guys, I've memor. I know what these books are about. If you'd wow. like to know, I can tell you. I read books to like step away with one thing I don't know if you read books that way where it's like if I could get one tangible thing that I can remember from it that I sticks with me then it's worth the book that's that's what I go into books being like what is the one thing I'm gonna take away from this I deeply resonate with the Emerson quote of you should read like a hawk looking for prey Mm -hmm. so like I so I've started this new practice I don't I think I have one nearby as I do it because I will show you this absolute unhinged system So like, it's not in this one, but typically what I do, you can't see because my thing is blurred. (laughs) Oh, geez. But like, what I'll do is I'll write in the book, like, why am I reading this? Mm -hmm. So that I have my intention and my why of why I've picked this up. So like the Neil Hoyne book, I wrote to myself, I'm reading this because I'm getting questions from senior leadership Mm -hmm. about how these social statistics are relevant to the KPIs Mm -hmm. of the larger company. And so as I'm reading, like you said, I'm reading fast. I'm speeding up. I'm slowing down because I'm seeing, I'm seeing like, I always say I read like I'm driving on the freeway. Mm. It's like, it's like, oh, this doesn't matter. This is just open space. Okay. Let's get to the next part. And then I'm like, oh, is that my exit? No, 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 no. Let me slow down. Okay. Now I can go back, speed up. And so like, I will make myself a real time now table of contents Mm. that is what's relevant to me. And then in the back of the book, I will take like the distillation Mm. of what I learned and like the main points. I'll like break the whole book, Mm. like at the end of each chapter, this YouTube book in particular, I'll put like what the relevant points are. I'll put the actionable next steps from the book. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. In the back of this YouTube book, I literally said, uh, (laughs) I said, uh, like basically it was a, an internet mutual recommended. This is one of my whys where I'm reading it. The other one is um, I want my video team to have the metrics they need to get the money mm-hmm. they deserve for the work they're putting out. I like that you actually write that down. Cause I'm like, in my head, I'm like, I know kind of why I'm picking this book up. Because yeah. It's like something I'm struggling with or something I want to learn more about. And like, I don't actually like it all stays in my head. And I think that's one. Th- so one thing I do is I do make a, a notion page for every book I read and then try to yep. put like notes there just so I know where it is. Cause I get a lot of library books. So I can't really write in them. Yeah. Or exactly. if they're on Kindle or something, which I do read a lot of Kindle books. Cause it's like, I love being able to highlight and turn them into quotes yep. and then upload to Google photos. And then I have an entire album of that. So I do things a kind of like a w- unique way too, where it's like, yeah, I have my system. I have a whole video on my YouTube channel of how I read books but it's it's like I think finding the reason why you read them and also just having it be part of your life because you're right like a lot of people don't read anymore and a lot of people yeah. don't read nonfiction like we do and I'm like why not you can learn so much and it's like yeah. you're, you're it's like 
It's like the lessons that you didn't learn in college, or it's the things that you you want to know instead of like yeah. spending thousands of dollars on a coach. Like you could just learn it by reading what they wrote, which is probably and I'm your also life's work, you know. And I'm also a huge proponent too of like fiction, right? And I think yeah. that was like one of the things I wrote. I struggle in the writing with fiction book. now. I used to read yeah. it all the time. I don't a lot of I'm people doing. like. But I think like, for example, a lot of times when I'm trying to explain difficult things, I will recommend fiction. Like I was having, you know, it's like the quintessential, like, what's the thing I should read to understand? Like, you know, right now we're in AAPI month and I'm like, here's some great fiction books you should read that'll drop you into the moment. Like the same thing, even with a certain respect to leadership, like I just gave one of the uh, the commencement keynotes at my alma mater. And like my go-to leadership quote that I give all the time is Toni Morrison. Like people are like, what's your favorite? And I'm like, Toni Morrison Sula. Like that book is brilliant and it has informed so much of how I see myself. And like my favorite quote of all time is when they realized they could be neither white nor male, they decided to be something else. And like Mm. that for me was an aha moment as a leader, which is like, it's shifted my paradigm in Mm pursuing more philosophical Mm -hmm. and ancient understandings of how to be a better leader than trying to read like the dude from this week or like you know I was reading a book actually was on the plane to LA which was last month and I was reading um oh what was it called I just bought it it's that one guy on Twitter that everyone follows um uh uh, the almanac of Neville Ravikant yes yes so I was reading that book, which is very intense. It's a very intense book. Cause it's like, it's written by somebody else about him and like some of yeah. his like philosophies. But one of the things that he talked about was like, Oh shoot. Now I like lost it. It was what you just said. It was like, basically like you have to figure out for yourself, like what's the, what's the point. He, one of the things he said was like, you can skip chapters in books if they're not relevant. Yeah. Which I'm like, that was like interesting. The first time I said that to people that like, I feel like people's minds got exploded when I said, you know, you can, yeah. you can just skip around to what's useful to you. I've had people reach out to me and be like that. I could never like, I, I got to yeah. read every page. And I'm like, well, we're not yeah. in school anymore. Nobody's going to be like, so do you remember chapter five of this book? Now there's some books that are cover mm-hmm. to cover for me, but most of them are like, what did I come here to get? Yeah. And oh shoot. I like had like a point of what I was bringing up about that book anyways but like so that's a great book just want to say like yeah there's oh what oh I remember the point he said read the classics not the currents yes he, said, he basically was like everything you need to know was in books that were written thousands of years ago and he's like go and he had a whole list of every book that like was like classic he talked oh, a lot about that. microeconomics or macroeconomics and micro yeah I, was like, I don't know anything about that I need to read that so like as I was reading this book he had a whole section in that book of like all the books he recommended because this guy's like really smart and he's like you know yeah we have modern philosopher but like he I was like, that's fascinating to me because you're right. Like there's a lot of great current books that are with the current times, but a lot of the like life lessons that you can learn were written by the Stoics or by these people from thousands of years ago, because it's like, they've stayed the test of time, you know? Like my, my favorite, I took in business school, my absolute favorite class was a class called leadership through fiction. Um, And I was fascinated with it because you are, you're reading these. I mean, I'm yep. at one point we watched game of Thrones and we analyzed mm. like, what is Robert Baratheon doing? Right. Mm. But I remember this is always funny because the professor, I ended up becoming his TA and he's a friend. Now I was saying to him, why do we start the class though with the autobiography of Frederick Douglass? And he was like, because that's a story that's so true. It feels as though it mm. could be fiction. And it's funny because as I started learning about stoicism, I was like, Oh, Epictetus and Frederick Douglass are the same person. Like mm-hmm. they're having the same experience of being, you know, ma- be having a master who is unwielding doing mm-hmm. these things. And it's like, how- it's just, it's really fascinating to me. And it's made me reframe and look at things different. It's like the pandemic when people mm-hmm. say to me in lockdown, like, how the hell did you become a memory athlete? And I'm like, because of live time versus dead time. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I looked at people like Malcolm X who came out of prison an entirely different person than they were when they went into this solitary Mm -hmm. kind of confinement. And I'm like, and I came out of it. I was like, so I realized I had a choice in this time of like, I can either improve or I can sit here every Mm -hmm. day staring out the window and being like, when will the world open up? And I'm like, and surprise, I came out of it being like a ranked memory. (laughs) Yeah. 
Well, I know I know we've mentioned your dad a couple times, and I don't yeah. know if people know the the the. the anything, yeah. I don't really. I didn't. I I had to look him up after I met you because I was like, I didn't know. Yeah. We didn't really talk about him. But how has? Can you explain a little bit of his story, and then also how that has impacted you and like your life? Because I feel like yeah. his journey and his experience has probably had a direct impact on how you were raised and how like maybe all of this kind of came to be in you, and yeah. how you were able to kind of like really push forward and, 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 and be able to do all the things that you would do now. You know? Definitely. Um, so my dad, Ernest Green was a member of, is a member of Little Rock Nine. They were a landmark civil rights group. Uh, after the decision of Brown versus board, they were the first test case. Mm -hmm. He was the lone senior. So ultimately the mm -hmm. burden of the experiment fell on him. Um, and he ended up graduating from Little Rock Central High School. They went in 1957. He graduated in 1958. And with that became the first African-American to graduate from a desegregated school in the South um, after Brown versus Board. Uh, I love to tease him because Martin Luther King came to his, uh, King Jr. came to his graduation. And mm. I'm off, you know, and people are always like, what wow. did you and Dr. King talk about? And he was like, I was 17. I didn't want to talk to this old man. Mm. Uh, like, he's like, I didn't want to yeah. talk to him about anything. Uh, and it was also very early. I mean, like mm -hmm. Thurgood Marshall stayed at my grandmother's mm -hmm. home wow. because he was one of the lawyers helping to adjudicate mm -hmm. the case on their behalf, all of this stuff. So like the man's got like a, a statue. He's yeah. got congressional gold medal he's got a you wow. know stamp I always say the weird thing about my upbringing and I and I attribute this because I have friends who have other members of the movement mm -hmm. like my childhood best friend her grandfather's Andy Young who was an advisor to Dr. Mm -hmm. King like I grew up with Santina Jackson Jesse Jackson's kids mm -hmm. around all this stuff mm -hmm. and I always say I don't know if this is a PTSD response to the trauma that they experienced but it wasn't ever something my dad discussed with me right mm -hmm. so it's like i was four years old we were on set for a disney film mm -hmm. with morris chestnut playing my father it's not at any point did anybody say this is a movie about your dad i was just mm -hmm. like oh it's called the Ernest green story or i was like everybody goes to the white house because mm -hmm. people in our lives were also there you know yeah. and it's like so it didn't really ever click for me like there was a level because the faces were recognizable that i was like oh everybody's friends are in history mm. flashcards everybody's mm. parents and grandparents are in history books mm. there are exceptions outside of this mm. but for the most part everybody does all this mm. I would say it wasn't until probably until I graduated undergrad and probably a little bit in undergrad as they were getting mm. they got they were the first statue on state capitol grounds dedicated wow. to a civil rights um act like you know kind of civil rights protest moment mm -hmm. um and they that's also I missed my sorority recruitment which I was mm -hmm. very peeved about because they were getting their um their stamp like I remember complaining in the fifth grade because I missed a class pizza party for the signing of the declaration for their congressional gold medal mm -hmm. and I was like there's a pizza party happening today can we wrap oh. it up um like that's absolutely so crazy unhinged. yeah that's crazy to yeah. think like you, you yeah you're a kid you don't understand yeah. the context and no. I think that's so true of anyone you know none of it made sense and it's not until I've gotten really to adulthood and I would more so say it was more like my senior year of high school is so I became my dad's speechwriter by accident oh, wow. um because Rosa Parks passed he was one of the eulogy mm -hmm. givers when she her body was in DC mm -hmm. My dad had a bunch of people write speeches. Mm -hmm. I, because a teacher knew about my father, mm -hmm. was asked to write a article uh, mm -hmm. for the school newspaper about Rosa Parks. He loved the article and ended up reading it. Mm -hmm. Now, most people thought he read an excerpt. They didn't realize he read the entire thing mm -hmm. as an eulogy. Um, and so then when I got to college, he was kind of like, hey, I have speeches. I don't like what people are writing for me. Can mm. you write this stuff for me? So I've gotten to learn and respect and understand his legacy mm. as his employee. If that gotcha. makes, that makes because, sense. Because yeah, yeah, because I'm sitting with him and having conversations and and trying to pull stories out of him gotcha. and having him things be like, oh yeah, you know, this time when I was having dinner with Lorraine Hansberry, and I'm like. He's like, or, oh, you know, Harry Belafonte and I flew on his plane down to Dr. King's funeral. And you're like, who are wow. you? What? You know? Yeah, it's nuts. And That's so crazy. 
and I think what it has informed my life now so I do think there was a level of I felt a lot of pressure not pressure that's a lie I felt a responsibility Mm -hmm. that people knew who we were not because of him or anything else I felt like oh people seem to notice him let me not embarrass my parents Mm -hmm. I think now more so in adulthood, I watched um, Valerie Jarrett on Henry Louis Gates's show. I love and, that show. I love yeah. finding your roots. I watch it every week. It's so good. And I there was a it. moment he was talking to Valerie Jarrett, who I know is Valerie Jarrett. And he then said, oh, well, she is this great because her father was X, Y, and Z. He, mm-hmm. he started talking about her roots. And that was kind of when it hit me. And this was maybe like two years before business school that I it hit me like, oh my God, my success and my story and me becoming someone will be how this legacy continues Mm. because people will look at me and go, that's really impressive. She's really effing cool. How'd you get here? And in the Mm. process, they will find him. I think I spent so much of my life Mm. thinking nobody would be interested in his story. And it's Mm. really, it really took I would say like around 2018 that I started being a lot more demonstrative and sharing <laughs> my family legacy. Yeah. Um, Cause I do take a lot of, pro- it's like people yeah. can feel like, wow, you've done so yeah. much, but I'm like, yeah, it's a reflection of this hard work, but you know, it's, it shows up in subtle ways in my life of like, I was saying to a friend recently, I was like, oh, I wish I had gone to public school. And they were like, well, considering what your dad went through, I can imagine he was never going to send you to public school. And like that kind of stuff is like, now I realize those little, those little oh, things have shown up, but, but yeah. I actually, I met Ruby Bridges. Yeah. Um, know her well. <laughs> she, yeah. So she came to my, my college and spoke and I got to, I was first in line to get her to yeah. sign my book. Cause I had, grew up watching her movie, you know, and I yeah. knew a lot of her story. And, and then I went on a civil rights trip, my junior year of college. And we went down, we went to where Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. We went to the museums there. We went to Alabama and I didn't know any, I grew up in the North. Like I grew up in Minnesota. Yeah. Like we, we didn't, we didn't learn any of this stuff. I mean, we kind of did in, in like elementary yeah. school, middle school, but like I got to see it firsthand and it's like crazy how like it seems so real. Cause it is in our, it's like not technically in our lifetime, but it's, you know, it's your dad. But it is lifetime. like, that's really the thing is, is like, when I try away. to, ex- like when I try to explain to people the context of this, like mm-hmm. I understand that my great grandparents on the green side, on my father's side were born slaves. Mm-hmm. So like a lot of times I'll wow. say to people like, yeah. So I'll say to people like, do you know your great grandparents? And they'll be like, yeah, my mom and papa. And I'm like, okay, so my mom and papa were born slaves. And they're like, huh? Like, I think yeah. what I feel such a deep responsibility to is to get people to understand history is not black and white photos. It's yeah. real people. Mm-hmm. Like, I think we oftentimes look at the world in this context of like, that was so, and I'm like, no, mm-hmm. that's my father not my Mm. grandfather like the man I called today (laughs) to check on how he slept is the same picture that like Jerry Jones is in as well like in the mob rooting Mm. against them you know it's like I think and I oftentimes am very cognizant it's a lot of why I took the the position even here at who what where I interviewed with so many people in senior leadership roles and saw no one that looked like me Mm. and it really hit me I can stay very comfortable and happy where I am, which I was very happy, Mm -hmm. or I can step into this place that's 15 years old that is incredibly respected across this particular industry and put somebody that looks like myself there. And like, you know, it's like of all the things going on in my day, the pressure I put on myself now to also be (laughs) a custodian Mm -hmm. of a larger legacy and conversation is a lot. And there are days I think like, why'd you even say anything? Like you should have just shut up and Mm -hmm. kept your head down and done nothing. But Mm -hmm. I think again, being a, a student of the Stoics and of the ancients, I would be doing myself, my, my philosophy, a disservice to have been like, what's the easiest, most comfortable, quietest way to exist. Mm -hmm. Um, and instead I have chosen a direction that it some days, like I said, I, you know, you're sitting on the couch doing, answering very deep questions. It's like the other day I was having a very deep theological question about, uh, by place as a Christian. And you're like, wow, I am doing this on a Monday in between meetings, 
because of my creator work. But yeah, I'm I'm so grateful for the grace of this burden of uh having my dad in my life in the capacity that he is. But you know, other days I'm just like I love to make fun of him and be like, you're not even like cool famous. Like you're not like you're not like yeah like you didn't do it like I just I give him such a hard time but I love him to death and I and I'm yeah. so appreciative does does he do mostly like speeches now is that like what his job is? a little like, bit but I mean speeches? he got into the world of finance so like he's also really fun too, so I don't yeah get it. <laughs> like you know what's funny is when you were yeah. saying the Ruby Bridges thing yeah. he is such an aggressively humble man mm. that like my mom and I often say to him you could have left the other eight and just gone out on your own but like when he got the movie from disney he wanted the others included in the story like he has had conversations and so it's it's really funny like he is so un not uninterested but it's like it's hard to get him to talk about that time like he's never written a book really like people are always amazed and i'm like he yeah. has no book he's never because he he just it's like I did a thing I yeah. I you know it's like he's very much like that's where my faith comes in it was very much like I was called to this I did my calling so what's the big deal like we laugh all the time that our favorite moment of torture for him was a musical was written about the nine largely about wow. him my dad's two least favorite things musical theater and talking about himself oh my god so to that's watch funny. him oh every god. to watch him that opening night being like and he again not neurotypical yeah. my mom and I oftentimes are like I think your father's on this she's like I think mm. your father's on the spectrum I think that's why he survived Little Rock because he can't read oh. these facial cues like because we laugh wow, over like that's fascinating yes. it's really fascinating because we wow. often joke that he doesn't know he'll like he won't read like you, yeah. you'll be like I'm really pissed off can't you tell and he's like mm. no and my mom goes I think your dad's on the spectrum and that's how he survived because these people were like I want to kill you yeah. and he's like good morning <laughs> and also just like the challenge and the and the thrill of that too exactly it's like exactly oh, you know like so oh, that's we're like experience. so we were like dying laughing because he's sitting there not realizing his face is like through the whole musical and we're like oh my gosh. bro are you good and he's like how many more songs are there and we're like it's a musical you're crazy mm. like it was just really funny he just was like he was in hell it was the greatest thing i've ever watched oh he was gosh, just like so he just kept being like are they gonna keep talking about me and we were like yes yes the story's about you <laughs> we were like the story is about you and he was just like no no oh my gosh that's so funny like it's just it's crazy how like it's like when it's your parent like it's a different yeah. experience than like oh, somebody it's... you read about or something you know it's like that we, it's we see him as you know well I think that's what always made it funny is like I think that's what also makes me a lover of history and time is I'm True. fully cognizant that history is not that far apart yeah. right and so it's like I've always loved it because in reality if people understood how compressed this timeline really is yes they there would be a lot more intellectual curiosity to understand it it's like I know on my mom's side that I have a grandmother who survived who was basically a survivor of residential schools as an indigenous mm -hmm. woman so it's wow. like so I don't look at those stories and go like wow that's so I'm like oh I have inherited the bloodline and strength of Sapanki cloud like yeah and I was gonna say my example is my grandma was a polio survivor so like exactly the poli like she had polio her entire life it wasn't she had it when she was a kid she was disabled her entire life she was yes. in a wheelchair my entire life so like the polio epidemic in the 1920s affected my family until this day because yes. my mom ra was raised by a grand by a mother who had polio so she wasn't able to work like there's like there's direct I think, and that's yes. the other thing too, is like, it wasn't that long ago and there are uh, repercussions of, of what yes. happened in history to that still linger today. I mean, look at our country. I everything, was just about to say like where we landed did, on yeah. the pandemic response is that I constantly thought that's to myself, true. like you said, people who survived the Spanish flu mm. polio must have been sitting there being like, just stay in your house. Just yeah. stay in your house. Just guys, just sit in your house. <laughs> like, because yeah. those people are carrying that, that weight of like, I, I've seen this story play out before. 
Philadelphia and I live in Minneapolis. So that was a very interesting experience in yeah. 2020. Yeah. And um, like that had never happened here. And like we'd, we'd again heard about in the history books of the riots and things. And so it's like ha having it happen in your backyard when I was running a local organization in the Twin Cities. And that was like the most yeah. insane, like two, three weeks of my life ever. Like I, I yeah. there was just a lot of we, we didn't know what was going to happen in the world. Like it was just it was an, it was crazy. But like, I think I learned a lot from that. And also I realized while it was happening, I'm like, this is going to be in the history books. Like while yes. it was going on, I'm like, this is going to be in the history books. I. But I think like, you know? so a perfect example over the Christmas holiday is like Jerry Jones, the owner mm -hmm. of the Cowboys. It came out that Jerry Jones was in the mobs protesting against oh, the nine, right? Gotcha. Oh, and so, that. yeah. And so that came out. Okay. It was very funny. My dad and I oh. had to drive to the CNN building so he could do the interview. And the whole time I was like, don't embarrass me. Oh, uh, but it, it's what you said about history, right? It's like, I'm aware when I'm watching certain moments in history or I'm history, meaning in the news in real time, or I'm watching people's mm -hmm. hot takes, like, even right now, the conversations about book banning. Mm -hmm. I know as I'm watching it, I'm like, some of you are going to like, and my friend who is Andy Young's granddaughter, we joke about this all the time is like, I go back to Little Rock with my dad now for these anniversaries. And you can't find a single person in the city of Little Rock that thought the integration was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. That was not us. That was other people. Other people, mm -hmm. we don't know. What? Us? Protest? Never. We thought it was the greatest yeah. idea ever. We all wanted you here. And it's like, that's what makes me laugh when I'm watching like people at a school board meeting, like mm -hmm. vehemently protesting against a book. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to have to answer to your grandkids mm -hmm. and your kids and your great grandkids. Oh, so and like, yeah. And it's like, so I watch things, like you said, it's like, I find myself being like, that's going to be in a history book, but yeah. not from the perspective of just the moment. I'm like mm -hmm. this picture of this mm -hmm. person is going to be in their history book. And your kids and grandkids mm -hmm. and great grandkids are going to come back and go, ain't this my Mima in mm -hmm. this book right here screaming? And it's going to be like, yeah. huh? Like, and I think, yeah. and I oftentimes think that's how we got to where we are in history right now is that people are very afraid to say they were on the wrong side, right? Mm -hmm. This is me being very me right now. But it's like, oftentimes I tell people like, when I would talk about uh, Colin Kaepernick, I would say, ask your parents or grandparents what they thought of Muhammad Ali's mm -hmm. protest against Vietnam. And they'd be like, huh? And I'd be like, exactly. The fact that you don't even know that exists means that we have just gone, let's not talk about it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and I, I think that we undervalue because I think we often say this phrase very flippantly of like, I'm standing on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, history is being written in real time yeah. you do not get to decide mm. what side you're standing on you just have to stand 10 toes down in whatever mm. side you're standing on true. because time will decide mm. who's standing on the right side That's of history so true I feel yeah. like we don't talk about this enough because I I just did a, a walk and talk interview with a genealogist I'm very into okay. genealogy I don't know if you've yeah. any genealogy but I, she... I yeah She's like, I, that's like one of my like hyper focuses that I've been <laughs> focused on for the last 10 years. But like, I find it fascinating. And she said, like, one of the things she, she, she said was like, talk to your grandparents, talk if they're yeah. around, like have them tell you stories because it's like, it makes you put into perspective. My grand, my great grandma actually wrote like a book. I have it yeah. on a PDF. It's like, she just typed it up on like a that's so cute. or something, but yeah, it's like, it's called the way it was. And it was literally that. just about like how she grew up, like what her elementary school was like. It was just like her life. And she didn't like yeah. accomplish anything exciting, but like it was what her, a snapshot of what her life looked like growing up. And it was just all of her memories. And I thought yeah. that was really cool that I have that. I have that from my great grandma. She died when I was in first grade. So okay. like, I didn't, I mean, I knew her a little bit, but like I got to read yeah. her words and I, 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 and, and, and I know your dad probably doesn't want to do this, but I think he should write a book or you help him write it because it's like, yeah. his words can be passed. I know he's probably done like videos and, and, and that sort of thing, but like those words could be so beneficial yeah. to future generations. And I think we like, talk about that you know? a lot now, which is like funny. Cause again, it's like, cause I talk about that a lot for myself. I've been thinking about this from the creator standpoint that like, if I yeah. had a million followers, what would I want to do with those followers? And I'm yeah. always like, write a book. Yeah. And so what's funny is 
my mom will say to me oftentimes now, she's like, yeah, I think the conduit to which your father's book will happen one day is like mm, through you. you. Mm-hmm. And I'm always like, that's wild to think. But mm-hmm. it is, it's just when you get into your genealogy, I take so much pride in my heart. Like, and I won't say hard work because I am trying to uncouple that. I'm reading mm-hmm. Rest is Resistance right now. But when I realize like the the epigenetics of the people mm-hmm. to whence I came from, it is staggering at times. Like I said, to yes. think of like great grandparents that were born into slavery, a great grandmother who survived uh, the, you know, mm-hmm. kind of basically having to hide so she didn't get taken to a residential school, you know, a grandfather who fought in World War One and the Battle of Argonne. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like when I break down all this stuff and people are like, you're doing so well. I'm like, am I though? Like, because mm-hmm. compared to these badasses, like I've just inherited yeah their sense of of ambition like I am I am just a beneficiary of the people that came before me like Mm -hmm. that's all I'm doing I'm just standing on somebody else's shoulders we have it easy compared to a lot of them like if you think like the depression my grandma was dirt poor she didn't okay this might be TMI but like she got her period really young and her parents didn't understand what was happening so they took her to the hospital like that's how uneducated people were you know like like it's just like I, I think that, um, sorry, we probably should end this podcast because I feel like we're going no. forever, but like, but I'm like, I think that, uh, I think that what our, what our history does, it repeats itself if we don't learn it, yeah. right? That's like the big thing. Yep. But also I do think trauma is stored in our bodies. I don't know if you've read some of that stuff, but like. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> the way, that's why I said I'm reading Rest is Resistance because okay. to realize the mm-hmm. people to whence I came from. Mm-hmm. That my obsessive pursuit with doing more and mm-hmm. making myself more valuable through my labor is low key a generational trauma mm-hmm. response that I am really working hard to uncouple. And it's yeah, like to make nothing. myself less of a machine mm-hmm. as a way to honor them. Like it is. I mean, everybody, you know, who follows me on social knows I'm a massive Disney adult. And that is my gift back to them is like mm-hmm. to do nothing, to be childlike to have a hobby that serves nobody, brings no value, value to anyone (laughs) and will never be useful and commodifiable. Um, But yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you know, listen, I know you're like, we got to end, but my thing is like, (laughs) this is, I think ultimately this kind of stuff that makes me so happy is like, I have gotten to where I've gotten to because of others Mm -hmm. while doing it with this neuro spicy brain. And I am so incredibly grateful anytime I get to Mm -hmm. exist in a space that could hopefully expand somebody else's vision. Well, I feel like I'm going to get emotional because I feel like I just really appreciate you. And like, I'm so glad that we connected online. I'm glad that we were able to meet in person because I feel like we have so much in common and we have so many like parallel lives kind of in ways yeah. where we're like just our interests and our and the things that we, we we work on and and I just feel like I'm just grateful that you took the time to come on the podcast and that you were able to share your story and I really hope that you get to a million followers because I feel like you deserve it and I feel like well it, you know I think it, listen I, I want to give you that's your goal. That's here's your the goal. thing I want to <laughs> give you your flowers because truly I think it is it's people like yourself who are creating these spaces for those of us that don't always feel like we fit into the right Mm -hmm. box to speak. And, you know, all I ever wanted when I was at my lowest or Mm -hmm. struggling to find a space is I just was very much like, I hope I can inspire somebody else. So you have inspired me and I am so grateful to you for giving me a space to, to maybe be able to do that for somebody else. So you deserve your flowers. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And how do we find you on social media if people want to Absolutely. follow you? Um, you can follow me on Instagram um, at Miss USA to MBA, like the degree. Um, I'm going to have a podcast launching in July with LA Comic Con mm-hmm. under the Sonar Network called The World Needs Nerds. Um, so I'll be sharing updates on that on my social. So we're recording now and, and I can't wait for people to come and listen. Um, and you can find me in my link tree you can find everything yeah, you're on from TikTok, my you're on twitter you're yeah everywhere. listen i'm all over the place and i'm always especially trying to mobilize this audience for good yeah. so anytime you see me guys raising funds for girl scouts or whatever yeah. you know feel free to drop in i was a girl scout love it <laughs> awesome all right well thanks for joining everyone and i'll talk to you next time Bye.